My name is Louise Gilding, and I'm the Executive Group Manager for Housing ACT. I'm from Canberra. <laughs> Canberra is not a bubble. It's the home of the Nulawal people, who have been there for thousands and thousands of years. And I am very privileged to call Canberra, Nulawal country, my home, and I thank the elders, yep. the Nulawal elders, for welcoming me and my family to the place where I belong. So I'm delighted to be here, delighted to be a facilitator uh, for this exciting closing session. Before I welcome our first speakers, well, we've got, we've got them sitting here on the stage, um, I do need to acknowledge our sponsors. So first of all, thank you to the support of the Northern Territory Department of Local Government, Housing, Community Development as our official host partner. Jamie, thank you to you and your team for a fantastic week. Thank you to our platinum partner, the Department of Social Services, to our gold sponsor, who are presenting the think tank this year. Thank you to Civica. And thank you also to our two silver sponsors, Mission Australia and Community Housing Limited. And of course, to all the other sponsors and the terrific conference exhibitors. I'm hoping you've all got your passport stamped, locked and loaded and ready to see who actually wins that. There's something, there was a prize, wasn't there, Michael? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael will get to that later. Um, and so, this morning's closing session, Four Nations, perspectives from Ireland, New Zealand, Canada and Australia. We have a beautiful array of accents on this stage for you to listen to this morning. <laughs> and, and Steve's just denying that he's Canadian, but that's all right. He has a good Canadian accent. You can put it on. It'll be as you have heard over the last few days, and indeed for a number of years, there is much debate around the need for a national housing approach to guide Australia's housing future. Whether this is through a national housing strategy or through some other mechanism to bring a cohesive approach to housing challenges. In planning this year's program, the Conference Organising Committee considered how best to address this question and how we as a country may be able to move forward in approaching our housing challenges. As we often do at National Conference, we don't just look in the but we also look to our friends. We look globally, in other parts of the world, for examples of best practice. So to drive this conversation forward, the committee saw value in bringing together a range of perspectives and experiences to look at the big picture and how like-minded countries are tackling their housing challenges. In recent years, we've actually taken a lot of inspiration from Canada with the announcement of their national housing strategy at the 2017 Abu Conference, and yesterday from Margaret. Margaret Foch, she was fantastic with respect to their Indigenous housing solutions. I was also privileged to be part of the Canadian to Study Tour for senior and housing officials led by Ahuru last year. We've got a lot to, lot to look at and a lot to take from um, the Canadian experience. So today we have invited another Canadian expert to our closing plenary to give us an independent appraisal. I love being able to speak from an independent point of view, Steve, of the latest on the implementation of their national housing strategy. From Canada, we welcome Steve Pomeroy, a housing policy consultant and senior research fellow at the Centre for Urban Research Education at Charlton University. Please give you a little whack. Not off. I'm going to off. Hang on. I was just going to get you to wave, and then I'll get you to come up as I go through. Now, moving down the panel, our nearest, nearest neighbour, New Zealand, has begun a number of ambitious federal programs, including Kiwi Build, which aims to provide 100,000, 100,000 affordable new homes for first home buyers within a decade, and also a wellbeing budget that puts vulnerable New Zealanders at its core. Joining us to talk about some of the New Zealand approaches is Professor Philippa Haddon Chapman from the University of Ta Otago. Our third nation represented today is Ireland. Ireland has, was particularly hard hit by the global financial crisis, including their housing market was very hard hit. And in responding to the GFC, Ireland launched the ambitious Rebuilding Ireland program with a bold action plan for housing and homelessness. So joining us to tell more about this national initiative is David Thank you for the way. The Director of Research and Corporate Affairs with the Housing Agency. So each of our esteemed guests will shortly give a presentation. They, have, they will keep to time so you can get to your flights. They will outline their country's approaches to housing policy. 
And then um, the executive director of the HURI, Dr. Michael Fobbington, offers a framing of the Australian context and reflections on the three international presentations. We'll then have a discussion and it'll be your turn to think of some questions that you might like to ask this fantastic panel. So let's get started. Canada, the nation perhaps most similar to Australia in terms of the government structures, population, indigenous issues, and which has begun to address housing through a national strategy. Please join me in welcoming Steve Pomeroy, the head of Focus Consulting, to talk to us about implementing Canada's two-year-old housing strategy. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, it's a privilege to be here and I give my respect to the Laurentian uh, people and the, uh, the elders, past, present and, and emerging, which is a, a, a tribute we also do in Canada, although I think you did it first. Um, it's a pleasure to be in, in, uh, in Australia. I think uh, Canada and Australia, are probably as the reason suggested, are two of the most comparable countries in the world, slide works. Um, as you already mentioned, you know, we come from a British colonial past, uh, a resource economy, a very large geography, are slightly bigger than yours, as you can see from the graphic. Um, the most interesting thing, I think, is that we're federating states uh, and an interesting dynamic uh, between the two levels of governments, which I've heard lots about uh, this week and uh, in the previous visit. Um, our housing tenure is remarkably similar, although there's some subtle differences in our social housing stocks, very close to yours, about 5%. And similar to what Peter Morris mentioned on, uh, on Wednesday, um, that number has actually come down in relative terms. It used to be at the peak of about 6.5%, um, because we haven't done much for the last 20 years. Uh, the rest of the housing sector has grown, of course, and it's actually is a rounding up to, point, uh, to 5, it's actually 4.7. Uh, so it's uh, um, it has been declining. One of the key features of our, our, our uh, housing, uh, social housing system, which is about 600,000 to 600,000 homes, the original third, as there was the case here in Australia, uh, was public housing built by our provincial housing uh, corporations or agencies with funding from the federal government, tended to be fairly large developments of fairly concentrated poverty. Um, and we reacted against that in the mid-1970s and essentially said if large-scale concentrated poverty with bureaucratic organisation is bad, small-scale community base must be good. Uh, I, I paraphrase a being the page report, but that was kind of a key message. Um, the, um, and, and the key feature of that system is so the community housing sector is two thirds of our stock and it's a very significant and important voice in advocacy which has been very significant in the development of the national housing strategy. And the key characteristics of our system is we basically funded everything with 100% financing. Uh, the, uh, the revenues that were generated from rents set, set 25% of households income were not sufficient to cover the operating costs and pay debt. And as a consequence, we had long-term operating agreements of 50 to 35 years, depending on which program it was, um, which have started to expire about four or five years ago. So this has been a very important part of some of the elements of the National Housing Strategy I'll talk about, sort of preserving and renewing the existing stock, not just thinking about, about building new. Um, so we did great things until 1994. Um, the, the guillotine dropped in February 1993 uh, when the, the Treasurer or the, uh, the um, Minister of Finance uh, had out the budget to end all new funding for social housing effective at the end of that year. Um, and not surprisingly, similar yeah. to the graph that Peter Morris showed the other day, uh, we saw a rise in the. Um, should have gone, yeah. uh, we saw a rise in the levels of housing yeah. needs and a significant I'm increase in the level of homelessness done. across the country. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, really that was really the beginning of the campaign to get a national housing strategy. Uh, we didn't have any funding, we had no, no activity whatsoever, and the community sector uh, began to, to advocate. And quite cleverly came up with a campaign slogan, we're the only GD country without a national housing strategy. Now it's completely untrue, um, but it became the rallying call for the sector. Uh, long, long before Donald Trump, our community yeah. housing sector perfected the art of fake news um, and con continued to do so for the next 20 years. The other key catalytic event that happened in the 1990s is uh, while we see homeless people unfortunately and tragically dying uh, in our cities all the time, we had two or three individuals die on the grates of the legislature in downtown Toronto in 1998. And it became catalytic in terms of public outrage that how can this happen in the country's richest house? And the mayor at the time of Toronto struck a task force. It's one of the rare instances in Canadian policy history that we've actually undertaken detailed research for empirically based policy development 
something that you are very privileged in here in Australia to have through a hurry. Um, and as a result of that particular piece of work, uh, they, 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 did, they were able to re-engage the federal government, initially in the area of homelessness with a national homeless initiative, and secondly, two years later, with a new framework agreement between the provinces, territories, and the federal government uh, to re-engage in the affordable housing, uh, the provision of affordable housing. The key difference in that new approach was there were no longer going to be ongoing subsidies. The treasuries really don't like long-term subsidy agreements because uh, it ties them into expenditure so they can't turn off capital grants. They can turn them off tomorrow. So it's more of a flexible tool for treasuries and they happen to like them. I think the reason set my slides to go ahead with that, aren't we? Um, the, um, um, so I think we, we, we basically saw the re-engagement, but it was a very modest re-engagement, uh, very low levels of funding, only produced about 5,000 units a year um, for, um, uh, for the next 15 years. And the most important part of it, and something I've heard resonating in these halls for the last few days, has been the fact that the, the funding, the initial framework agreement was five years, and it was subsequently renewed uh, four times over the next, the next 10 years, usually from one to three years, and usually at the 11th hour. Our fiscal year ended March 31st, so on March 30th they would say, oh yeah, we're going to review this for another year. So the, the unpredictability, uncertainty, and difficulty in creating a pipeline of development was a real serious issue, which, which also became part alongside the, we're the only country without a national housing strategy. We need certainty, we need long-term funding uh, in order to create a, a strong uh, housing sector, uh, affordable housing uh, provision. And after 20 years of doing that, um, the, the writers of the Liberal platform in 2015 wrote it right into the election platform. Uh, it's, uh, um, Justin Trudeau uh, likes to, uh, like yep. to say the sunny days had returned. Um, everything was going to be great under the new Liberal government. He, in his letter to mandate letter to the minister, he directed him to, um, to, to re-engage the federal government in a significant way. In, in, in addressing uh, the affordable housing issues. And that began the process of creating a national housing strategy. And we went on an extensive consultation period. Um, I think the official uh, slogan was, uh, let's talk. Um, there's a little bit of editing on this slide where I modified it slightly because I think we did too much talking. Um, and it, I mean, it was a very, very extensive consultation, which in some respects is good. Um, but I think we got very much into the weeds and spent a lot more time than we really needed to. And, and I think had we had the, the Ahuri app, we could have probably figured out in about five minutes what the priority should have been. But we took a year and a half to do it and, and came up with these ones. Um, the, uh, the most significant was distinctly, essentially issues of affordability uh, uh, were, were, were very much central to the strategy. And indeed we see in the elements of the national housing strategy addressing affordability issues is the key, key direction. Um, preserving the existing, existing housing stock, as I mentioned, because of the expire of those agreements and the risk we would lose the existing 600,000 units uh, was a very serious um, element as well. And then some, some mention of so the, the broader housing system, although I would argue the way it's rolled out, the national housing strategy is very much an affordable housing strategy. It's not really a comprehensive strategy in terms of addressing issues in the marketplace, which can have knock-on effects back into the affordable part of the system as well. It's a little bit weak in that area. And there is a token reference to environmental sustainability, which has been embedded in some of the program funding requirements um, in, in a, a little bit of a difficult way, which I'll come back to. <laughs> the, um, the, the, one of the things we have noticed over the last four years is we've been inundated with announcements and re-announcements and press releases uh, about how great this is. The first ever national housing strategy, which kind of like the slogan, isn't actually true. Uh, the largest expenditure we've ever seen on, on housing in Canada, um, which, well, we'd never done a 10-year spending plan before, so of course it was the largest one we've ever seen. Uh, but on a year-to-year -year basis, it wasn't really that much more than we'd had in the past. Um, and while there was a fairly serious engagement with the provinces and territories, I don't think they were really treated as an equal partner. And an important part of that is for the last 30 years, most of the new delivery, uh, both before the, the re-engagement in 2001 and subsequently, was delivered through our, our provincial and territorial housing agencies. The federal government was very much a passive investor, very much on the sidelines, completely lost its expertise, corporate memory and knowledge. And indeed, the folks that were developing the national housing strategy, who I was asked to go and advise, um, as I sat in the room with these folks, there wasn't a single person in the room who had been in the housing field for more than four years. Uh, and maybe that brings a fresh perspective, but it certainly brings a lack of history uh, and understanding of what can and can't work.
So I think we, don't, we didn't really rely to the extent we could have done on the, on the accumulated expertise and capacity that existed in our, our potential housing organizations. So the National Housing Strategy set out two overarching goals. Reduce housing need by 50%, which is just over a million, so 530,000 households, and reduce chronic homelessness by 50%, uh, uh, both over 10 years. So relatively ambitious. I think the advocates in the homeless area have suggested we could have actually set a goal of ending chronic homelessness completely, not just 50% reduction. And I don't think that would, be, would have been overly ambitious, but it certainly does set the bar reasonably high and require us to therefore focus on uh, resourcing the plan to meet those targets. So how are we going to do that? The, the first part was to build 100,000 new homes over the next 10 years, which is only 10,000 a year, really not that much. Um, the rest of it, though, most of our problems in Canada, as is the case here, are issues of affordability. So if someone's paying too much for their rent but they're living in an adequate, suitable house, why do we go and go, go out and build a new house and give it to them for life? Uh, rather than giving them assistance to be able to afford their rent. We don't have a Commonwealth Rental Assistance Program in Canada, and the National Housing Strategy has proposed to create one. Uh, it wasn't Im implemented at the beginning of the strategy in 2018. It's, it's uh, scheduled to start in uh, next year, uh, April 2020. Um, and because the strategy is cost-shared with the provinces and territories, and they were, at the, at, again, at the 11th hour, uh, and unbeknownst to them, there was sort of a sleight of hand in the, the, the funding for the national strategy, and they moved $2 billion uh, from the pot that was going to be allocated for spending by the provinces and territories on essentially new, new affordable housing development into the Canada housing benefit. Um, and you know, in some respects, the provinces are responsible for social welfare and income assistance, so having them involved makes some sense, but it is creating some very difficult negotiations around how we actually design and implement the, the housing benefit. Um, so it remains to be seen. I think we have, will be a natural experiment, as you are to some extent here in Australia, with, with our 13 different jurisdictions all doing things in a slightly different way. Uh, and I suppose from a research point of view, that's good, because we can look at what's happening differently. Um, but in terms of portability, uh, consistency across the country, uh, we may see some issues arising there. And the, other, the last part, as I mentioned, and a significant level of the funding, uh, is allocated to actually just preserving what we've got, not growing anymore. Uh, it's renewing the existing stock, a lot of those developments and, and um, uh, public housing developments in particular, the older ones, are in the older parts of our larger cities, which because of intensification pressures now have very high land values, are very underutilizing the land. There are opportunities for intensification and renewal, so we can add, add, add it's estimated, about 60,000 new units on those existing lands, as well as rehabilitating the, um, the um, existing uh, homes and making them uh, uh, more modern and, and livable. So that's a very significant part of the funding. Much of that, because it's administered at the provincial territorial level, will also implicate the provinces and territories. And, and sort of, I suppose it's a bit of a scathing indictment uh, of the implementation of the strategy that, you know, four years on, uh, we still haven't negotiated bilateral funding agreements with two of the 13 jurisdictions. Uh, it took us 15 months to negotiate with the first 11. Uh, so they were quite difficult negotiations. So it hasn't been all happy days and, and, and great collaboration, despite the rhetoric that I showed you in that particular paragraph from the, the, um, the strategy about partnership and collaboration. Um, so where does that get us uh, in terms of, you know, what, what are some of the insights that we've, we've learned from the strategy? I mean, I think setting ambitious goals is a good thing. Uh, and, and having quantifiable targets to measure progress over time is very, very important. And I think that will help us to sort of measure and, and hold government's feet to the fire. Um, I would argue $40 million, it sounds like a lot, but it's really not very much. And the advocates have to keep up the pressure and actually raise the bar on that amount of money over time to, so that we can actually achieve uh, the desired outcomes. I think the big win was the long-term predictability and certainty that we have in a 10-year funding program. Um, the weakness, as I'd suggested, is that I don't, you know, while we built on the strengths of the community housing sector and are, are utilizing their existing assets and giving them funding to renew those assets and, and building some, some capacity because they've been managing properties for the last 30 years, they haven't been doing a lot of asset renewal and development. Uh, so we have to rebuild that a bit, and I think we are doing that. Uh, we haven't relied to the extent we could have done on the, the accumulated expertise of the provinces and territories. Um, 
And those are significant assets uh, that, we, that we can really utilize to stretch limited public funding further, free land, intensification on its existing sites, and so on, and, and the rent revenues that will be flowing in these developments, which will be mortgage-free, and hence we'll have some, some financing capacity to go out and borrow. And we have an equivalent of um, an, an NFIC, uh, your, your funding program, financing program, uh, in Canada as well, very low-rate financing, and about 15 billion of the 40 billion in the national strategy is actually financing, not, not capital grants. Um, so it's, uh, there is significant lending opportunity there. I think we, we tended to overlook the, the larger housing system. Um, you know, if people can't access home ownership, they stay in the rental market. If we have excess demand in the rental market, we have declining vacancy rates, rising rents, and increased issues of affordability. So thinking about what's happening in the rest of the system is, is equally as important as just putting money into the affordable housing part of the system. And I think we need to spend a bit more time uh, building out that part of the strategy. It's not a static document. It should evolve and change over time, and hopefully it will, although it's been slow to do so so far. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned on the consultation, uh, I'm a big fan of Nike, just do it. Um, you know, you know try, run some things out there, experiment a little bit, and then fix them when they don't work quite right. I think our, our federal agency spent too much time trying to get the details absolutely perfect, went to cabinet to get approval, and now when, when people like me point out to them, you know, this really isn't working very well, you shouldn't have done things this way, you know, can, can you change this? And they come back and say, well, we can't change that because cabinet approved it that way. Well, they only approved it that way because you made the recommendation and they approved it. So I think we have to sort of think through you know, the, 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 a more transparent process in terms of identifying mechanisms and approaches that are actually going to work. And finally, um, as I mentioned, you know, we started advocating 20 years ago uh, to, uh, to, for a national housing strategy. Uh, and we came up with a great slogan. So I say, you know, don't let the truth get in the way of a good rallying cry. You know, if it works for you, go with it. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Steve. New Zealand, our closest neighbour, which shares many cultural and financial links, but has a, simple, a simpler governance structure. Please join me in welcoming Professor Philippa Howden Chapman, Professor of Public Health at the University of Otago, to talk to us about rebuilding public housing in New Zealand, and in particular, how her team's randomised community trials in partnership with local communities provide evidence to inform housing, health, and safety. Welcome. Good morning. I'd like to pay my respects to the Larrakia people, the leaders, past, current, and emerging. Tenakoto Katoa. I'm going to briefly talk about um, what has changed since the new government came in um, at the end of 2017, effectively from 2018. I'm going to um, take a brief departure from what is very similar colonial history across the, all the countries that you are here today to talk about the role of research um, and what that's played um, directly and indirectly in housing policy. And then I want to give you um, a discussion. I'm going to focus on Housing New Zealand, on the, on the creation, the revitalization of public housing in New Zealand, and before concluding. When the government came in 2017, one of the top issues was the state of housing in New Zealand. We had an uh, unprecedented rise in homelessness in particular, which really disturbed people. Um, and I was asked, along with two of my colleagues by the incoming um, Minister of Housing, um, um, Minister Twyford, to do a stock take of New Zealand housing. And the g books of the government were opened up, uh, and we were asked to say what we thought were the key issues, not to create policy, obviously, but to have informed evidence-making. And there's a number of points along the side, which I'm not going to go into, but basically, the situation was not too dissimilar from um, Canada. We had a, a major decline in home ownership. We had, a, um, as you'll see at the bottom there, a rise in homelessness work that my group did from the census and census of um, people who are emergency housing. One in 100 people were um, in insecure or homeless housing. Um, rents had risen, the number of affordable housing had dropped, and there was a general 
um, consensus that we needed to have a, a strong strategic policy going forward if we were going to make any difference. Just as we know when we put on weight, it's very easy to put on weight with all the nice food here, but very hard to take it off. Once you start to get on a trajectory of problems, it's very difficult to deal with them systemically. Um, one of the areas that concerned many of us, particularly in public health, um, was that Māori and Pacific, um, the main migrant people to New Zealand, home ownership had declined um, rapidly compared to um, European home ownership. Um, and that's, I walk past that every day going to work. Um, and that's the kāinga, the house with the warrior in front representing that they're the people who own the land. Private rentals are older, they're built often before there was any building code or whatsoever, and they were less stable. We had very, we had very lax um, uh, rental laws. And a growing number of older people um, did not own their own houses. Now, um, um, Louise mentioned that I'd, we'd done a number of um, randomized controlled trials that had had an inter influence nationally and internationally, you'll be pleased to know I'm not going through them. I'm just going to highlight the, the areas that they, um, that they addressed. Insulation, retrofitting insulation, proper heating, injury prevention, reducing mold, doing what can be done for a household where there's a, about to be a newborn child, doing everything we know that works to try and stop those children going to hospital. Secondary prevention, once the child is in hospital, what can we do to remediate the homes, our warm homes program, um, well homes program, and also giving older people um, vouchers to make sure that they don't suffer from fuel poverty. And then a quasi-experiment, we tried actually to make some policy to regulate our rental housing better. Um, the warm-up New Zealand was a result of the work that, partly the result that we've done on insulation and heating. And um, th this is, consider I consider, a really great um, success story of how our research evidence, robust research evidence, can have a provide an evidence base for policy. Because both the, both the um, national government that was then in power has followed on from the... Uh, the national government followed the policy with modifications that the Labour Green government had done previously and continued this retrofit insulation program, had a huge publicity campaign, and um, my husband's an economist and he did some very useful um, uh, cost-benefit studies with very broad um, benefits and found that the benefit um, cost ratio for insulation was four to one for the general population and six to one for children and for adults. Now, actually, I, w I wanted to make a w one um, point going back there. Um, oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, coming out in the agenda, um, the AUT um, publication, you'll see a comparison of the policy, because we're a unicameral government, there's only one house, um, between us and the project that you had, program that you had, your shovel-ready program run by the Rudd government, which was ended up pretty disastrously, whereas our one has continued as one of the bipartisan successful policies in New Zealand because it was grounded in local initiatives and people who knew their communities well. Um, just to update this very quickly, we've now gone back and looked at this program um, with now a quarter of a million homes. And you'll see, those of you who are familiar with um, reading these, just a minute here. Mm. Is, this the, is this the pointer? Yeah, um, here, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you can see here, this is, if it made no difference, it would be this line here, but you can see all the results here. This is work done by a doctoral student of mine. Um, shows that there's a very effective reductions um, in hospitalizations, greater for cold-related things, and most interestingly, Pacific peoples who live in poorest housing and elderly gain the most benefit. These are very important um, information to feed into the policy agenda. Likewise, mold. We found, um, along with our Finnish colleagues who we worked with, that when children were in homes where there was mold, which we measured very carefully, they were more likely not just to have worse respiratory systems, but to develop wheezing and asthma. Uh, this is the next study where we went into the homes and we said, okay, let's do all that we can, um, and we're, result we're just producing the results now. We presented, uh, we sent in local builders to fix up falls around to prevent, fix up homes to prevent falls. And you can see here that had um, huge 
benefits, um, just very simple actions. And because we've got ACC, we can measure what effect those had. And this is the electricity vouchers and the well homes. And one of the things that we've done is we found that um, children move around a lot, and when they move around, it affects their um, behavior and their education. So one of the things that Housing New Zealand is doing it is having more stable um, policies. I won't talk about this except that we tried to get, a, war, um, get particular councils in a, in a natural experiment that was luckily gazumped by the um, residential tenancies help when the government came in. The residential tenancies, what's called the healthy home standard. And they built on, um, on the work that we and other colleagues had done on heating, insulation, ventilation, moisture entry and draft stopping. And so this is a real improvement in the rental standards in New Zealand where most people on low incomes uh, and, and actually most children grow up now. Um, I, I, at the same time, I was chairing a WHO committee on the housing and health guidelines, which I don't think we've heard anything about in the sessions I've been in. In any case, it was not very popular where well, this gentleman, Mr. Mike Butler, who was stopped the war on tenancies, um, and um, when it came through, he said, who has done this? And it was the WHO, so we were, I was quite proud about this. So this is the, the, the guidelines that, um, are, are supposed to influence policy and hopefully will be adopted by countries around the world. Uh, now, our government, um, the Minister of Finance, um, Minister Robinson, has brought in a well-being bu budget, one of the first from in countries in the world, and it marks a big departure from um, what was previously. The national government's view was very similar to what we heard in Canada. Social housing was um, slum housing, um, according to a former prime minister, and should be sold. Um, the Labour-led government, and they did sell quite a lot, uh, Labour-led government reaffirmed the right to housing and the role of state and supply. So this is a departure from the things I was talking about retrofitting, where both Labour and National agreed that it had merits. The new increasing um, public housing, and I have the privilege to be on the board of Housing New Zealand, but I'm speaking here wearing my academic hat. Um, and this is, gives us an opportunity to look at um, co-benefits, um, particularly ones about climate change, social and environmental issues. Now, Housing New Zealand is a crown agency. It's got $28.6 billion in assets. Similar to Canada, it houses about 4% of the population. And now it's on a trajectory of ha having major building projects as part of a long-term investment planning. And they're the first um, um, uh, organization to raise um, um, sustainability bonds, use the basis of the improvements that we know are possible in housing, 1.3 billion, it was um, a very successful. So to, in the last financial year, there was a lot of celebrations. We built 1,472, we, <laughs> uh, which was a 41% increase from the year before. This was a huge effort by the organization. Um, broad outcomes and social procurement and working very closely with local councils. And this is an example of one of the um, um, apartment dwellings locally um, with the Po of the, um, the local tribe there. Housing New Zealand strategies, very good strategies. They're building to home star six and above the code. Uh, healthy homes and they follow the, and above the Healthy Homes Guarantee Act. They recognize the WHO guidelines. There's an emphasis, and I can't stress enough this meme when I hear it back from taxi drivers and people who don't know anything about housing. Warm, dry, safe, and stable housing has become the mantra in New Zealand, a recognition that this is more than just bricks and mortar. This is social infrastructure. Um, there has been some great business, new, new innovative business modeling, this innovate, partner, and build, a recognition that if we don't things right, do things right, our engineers and our builders all come across the ditch and work for you, and then we have big shortages. So we have these, we've developed um, these, we, relational contracts with preferred builders, um, emphasis on safety and apprenticeships. There's a big problem with um, mental health of um, uh, builders who've had to work in very tight um, um, conditions and um, there's been quite a lot of instability in building companies. Recognizing that and paying the living wage. 
where there's an alliance contracting with civil engineers, which I think has required a lot of uh, negotiations, but means there's a kind of relational contracting with these preferred people. There's a commitment to urban regeneration. We're trying not to be one of the most sprawling, or trying to stop Auckland being one of the cities that has the most sprawl, uh, and social inclusion, and increased accessibility and customer focused. So um, in conclusion, gosh, and finish too early. <laughs> in conclusion, I'll make this very slow and speak slower. <laughs> the current government puts high priority on increasing the number, the proportion, and the quality of rental housing, and, partic uh, uh, and particularly of public housing. And I think that I hope, and I've hoped, uh, tried to stress in here, we mu make much more progress where we can go back to being uh, having a general direction of bipartisan um, policies. Of course, governments will put different emphasis on different parts. But if we had to go from a standing start again about public housing and affordable housing, that's very problematic. Um, I think that research evidence for increasing quality standards and importance of stability strengthens public support. I mean, people get the fact that it's not good for children to be in homes where there's evictions, and then they, the, the, the local morai have done some fantastic jobs of um, taking in people who are homeless and living in cars, but that's no way for um, um, children to live and do well at school. Um, Housing New Zealand is about to be, what is the word, absorbed, eclipsed, transformed into a new organization, which we take some um, uh, pleasure in the fact that they've adopted the name of our research group, uh, kāinga meaning house or village, uh, ngā mean, meaning do, do, and ora meaning health in a very broad broad sense. It's a community organization and one of the things that it's doing is developing increasing capacity to work with and for Māori and that's a wonderful Mōrai at Wainui and Mata um, where, I, where the, I'm working with the local people to use our evidence to, um, for the kind of papakainga, the housing around the Mōrai that's going to be used and it's got renewable energy we hope on top of the Mōrai roof. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Philippa, that was fantastic. I love the evidence, the research base that um, New Zealand bases its policies on. I'm a policy wonk and I, I want to come and work for you. All right, Ireland, no. A nation heavily impacted by the GFC that was, has responded through a strong focus on economic and social benefits of addressing housing at a national level. Please join me in welcoming David Silk, Director of Research and Corporate Services Housing Agency Ireland, to present Ireland's approach to housing and affordability supply, Rebuilding Ireland, Action Plan for Housing and Homelessness. Welcome. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Larrakia people as well, and um, I suppose as custodians of the land that we're on and to pay my respects to the leaders past, present and future. Um, and uh, thank you very much Louise and for that introduction and thanks to Michael and his team for inviting me and for uh, the hospitality that they've shown me over the last uh, few days. So why is Ireland interesting? Um, well, I suppose Louise has told you a little bit about the housing crisis that we went through 10 years ago. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more during my presentation about how we have, I suppose, rebounded a bit and started to rebuild. Um, but we've also had significant tenure shifts over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, over the last century, we developed, uh, grew a lot of home ownership. Uh, but in the last 10, 15 years, our tenure has 
become more diverse with a particular growth in the private rented sector, much more regulation and much more of a long-term option for people, uh, which may be of interest. The way we provide social housing has also changed. Uh, we've moved away from just local authorities providing the traditional medium to large uh, estate uh, segregated from home ownership uh, to a much more diverse uh, type of accommodation with more funding and more use of uh, what we call approved housing bodies and what you call community housing. Uh, and uh, yesterday the plenary on affordability was particularly interesting to me because we have used a lot of affordability measures as well to try and increase affordability. Uh, and we have also seen dramatic changes in homelessness uh, over the last few years. There's been a growth in homelessness, uh, but also a shift in the nature away from um, mainly males uh, with addiction problems to an increase in the number of family homelessness, which we've never really had before to that extent. Uh, and that has proved very challenging to us. We're also uh, increasing the amount of regulation that we do and I think that's particularly interesting. And finally, the strategic approach, uh, and I wanted to talk mostly about that. Um, housing loves certainty, and I think a strategic approach brings that certainty uh, to the table. It sets goals and uh, it sets targets, uh, and for uh, Rebuilding Ireland, it's very much setting targets uh, by the government for us to all um, agree to. It also means that we know what kind of funding is going to be available um, in Ireland, we tend to, to, to finance things on a year-by-year -year basis, but that doesn't really work for the housing cycle. So for the first time, we've had a much more long-term funding model. And the process itself, I think, helps to develop consensus about what the priorities are and how we're going to deal with them. And it reassures the public in terms of um, that something is being done because housing has been the, one of the biggest things. Uh, but I suppose on the downside, one of the things uh, about strategy is that things can change a lot. So our economy has improved much quicker than we had anticipated. Uh, our population is now on the up again, um, although I've met quite a lot of Irish people here in Australia over the last few days. Uh, but uh, uh, we, we're, we're taking you all back now, if you wouldn't mind coming back, please. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> And, um, of course, uh, Brexit, um, three years ago, we didn't know anything about Brexit, but it is going to have a big impact on, on our economy in Ireland. So uh, these things uh, are important. So this is just a picture of the housing agency. Uh, we're based in two Georgian buildings in Dublin, and um, we operate on a national basis. We advise government in terms of uh, housing policy, uh, but we also work with others around the delivery of housing. So we have planners and architects, as well as people buying properties uh, for uh, our approved housing bodies and for social housing and we do research and uh, we also help with policy implementation. Um, our vision is to promote the building of sustainable communities. Our full title is the Housing and Sustainable Communities Agency. Um, for us, sustainable communities are um, to do with uh, well-designed neighborhoods that people live in and as housing people, you probably go around and say, hmm, would I like to live here? And that's the kind of sustainable communities that we are, we're looking for. Our population is quite small, so we're just coming up to five million. Um, we're a young population, but interestingly enough, um, more and more older people. So our projections are that um, the numbers over 65 are going to really increase in the next uh, 20 years, and particularly those over 85, and that's going to have sort of quite interesting implications for us with the type of housing that we have and the type of housing we'll need in, into the future. As I mentioned, um, a lot of home ownership, um, and a lot of people own their properties outright, um, nearly 40%. Uh, so, but the private rented sector has increased uh, doubled in size over the last while and now it makes up about 20 percent and as rented social is about 10 percent so, so, so not a little bit more than you, you you hear in australia but not not too far off um, this is the scary slide which shows um, house building over the last um, 30 years or so and as you can see during the 70s and 80s we built about 25,000 um, new homes every year and then we started uh, increasing that very substantially. And in 2006, I think we built about 90,000 new properties and new homes for people. So there was this kind of thing, we need more and more and more, and more is, is equal to success. Uh, the, the big crash came, and as you can see, um, three or four years later, we were building less than 10,000 new homes per year. So that's, can you imagine that in terms of the, the construction industry? Uh, and, and in terms of uh, the numbers of people who are working in that, in that sector and the importance of the sector to the, to the economy. Um, and I suppose straight away we were trying to see how we might uh, re 
invigorate the construction industry and it has taken quite a long time. Under Rebuilding Ireland, which I'll be talking to, to you about in a second, our plan is to try and get that back up to 25,000 um, new homes per year and we're nearly there. Next year we should be, we should be back onto the 25,000. Um, this will just show you what house prices went. So during the, the, the crash, house prices went down by about 50%. So if you were lucky enough to be able to sell your house, um, and uh, many, many houses were in uh, negative equity, uh, having bought at the boom, they were unable to, to sell and un unable to afford uh, to pay the mortgage on them. Um, but uh, as you can see, our house prices have gone back up again, uh, but have stabilized uh, in, the last, in the last while. Um, the rental market, as I said, is, has uh, increased in popularity. Again, rents went down about 30% during the recession and have edged back up. And uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about uh, the mechanisms that we've put in place to try and cap um, rental inflation. And as you can see, it's hopefully beginning to take um, effect as the, the in, uh, things have begun to level off a little bit in terms of, of rental inflation. I should say these slides are going to be available. I know they're, they're fairly detailed, but um, I'm running through them fairly quickly just so that, uh, but you can, you can look at them in more detail. So the action plan for um, ha housing and homelessness, um, it's a, a five-year plan. Um, and uh, we, uh, I suppose, um, it's, it's based on the idea that housing is fundamentally important to the economy uh, and to people. Uh, you can't uh, operate without good housing. Uh, there were previous plans uh, to try and reinvigorate the construction industry and to restart social housing. Uh, and this plan came in under a new government. Uh, it was brought in within 100 days of the new government and based on a broad political consensus. So there was a parliamentary committee which met and uh, outlined the scope of uh, what needed to happen and um, there was consultation with stakeholders as well, and then from that it was developed. Uh, it was also responding to the issue of homelessness, which at that time was a top priority for the government. There were a number of very high profile tragedies around homelessness where people were found um, dead on the street, one person found just outside the parliament, uh, and it really was uh, very influential in terms of looking at, at the whole issue of housing. So there's five pillars to the, um, the program, and I'm going to run through each of those in turn. Uh, there's over um, 80, 90 actions in total, um, so uh, I'm not going to go through them all, uh, but I'll just give you a, a sense of what, what they're like. Uh, so it's a six billion program um, over the next five years uh, to produce 50,000 social housing um, homes. Um, some of them will be built, some of them we will be buying, and some of them will be leasing. So there's that division. Um, and then we will also be helping people to more secure accommodation in the private rented sector through uh, what we call the rental accommodation uh, schemes and the housing assistance payments, which is a sort of a housing benefit for people living in that sector. Pillar one then, it's no uh, coincidence that pillar one is about homelessness. It was the number one key issue in relation to housing policy. Um, th and here's a, a list of the types of responses which are in the strategy around a rapid building program, um, which hasn't actually turned out to be that rapid um, <laughs> uh, um, because of mainly because of procurement, uh, which isn't rapid at all. If anyone's involved in procurement, I, I, I bow to you. Um, we operate under very strict EU um, procurement rules and, and so uh, the rapid build program is only just getting going now but once it does get going it, it hopefully will be more rapid. Uh, we've also um, uh, introduced housing first for homeless people. This is mainly for people who are chronically homeless and uh, the national director Bob Jordan I think came over to Australia recently and was talking to some of you about the program. In the housing agency, we've been buying properties for the housing, pro housing first program, and it's, it's actually very challenging to find the right types of properties uh, for that group of people and making sure that you have them in the right locations and that, that they suit people's needs. Um, also under pillar one, just to draw your attention to the mortgage to rent scheme, we have a particular problem around mortgage arrears, particularly for people who bought during the height of the boom. Uh, so there's a substantial a number of people or a number of mortgages that are in arrears of more than two years. Uh, and as part of the prevention program around homelessness, uh, there's a, a mortgage to rent where you can um, sell your property to uh, a, a community housing um, and become a social housing tenant staying in your own property. Um, we are helping to operate that scheme and uh, it is beginning to have an impact in terms of making sure people don't become homeless. 
Uh, pillar two is around uh, increasing the supply of social housing. And as I mentioned, um, uh, the, the plan is to uh, develop 50,000 uh, uh, social housing homes uh, over the next few years. The program is working quite well. Uh, it has worked quite well in terms of acquisitions uh, and leasing, and the building program is now up and running. Uh, some local authorities are finding it more difficult to get their building program going again because uh, during the recession there was no building program. Uh, but the community housing sector has been very um, forthcoming in terms of the building program, and uh, there's a, a large number of uh, sites uh, operating at the moment. The housing agency uh, has a 70 million euro revolving fund, so the government gave us 70 million, thank you, and uh, we're using that to buy vacant properties uh, from banks uh, that were uh, uh, abandoned or uh, were uh, repossessed due to mortgage arrears, and we are buying them and then selling them on to the community housing sector and to local authorities. We get the money back and then we go out and buy again. Um, I suppose the, the value of that is that as a national agency, we can go to the banks and buy a portfolio of properties in one go and then uh, sell them on to different people in packages uh, that suits their requirements. Uh, we're also regulating the community housing sector. Uh, up to now, that was on a voluntary basis, uh, but it will be on a statutory basis shortly. The legislation has been um, published on that. Pillar three is around more homes. So this is um, getting back to the delivering 25,000 homes per year. Uh, and we have a whole um, ream of, of different ways in which we're doing that. One of the ones I wanted to talk to you about was the planning reforms. Um, planning was identified as one of the um, difficulties in relation to uh, getting access to uh, new homes. And uh, we introduced a new scheme where property, uh, where developments over 100 units uh, could go straight to our national planning body on board Planola rather than going to the local authority and it would fast track through the planning system. And that has been working uh, quite well. Uh, and it's now uh, up for review um, in, to see if we will extend it for another uh, two years. Um, da -da. So, uh, pillar four is around the, um, the rental sector. So, um, as I said, this uh, increased in size, doubled in size over the last uh, 10 years. Um, big issues around standards, uh, which probably won't um, surprise anybody, uh, but new standards have been introduced and are being um, applied by the local authorities. We have a residential tenancies board, which is a set up as a statutory body. Uh, it regulates the rental sector. Um, all uh, tenancies are registered with the residential tenancies board, and they deal with any uh, disputes between landlord and tenants, uh, either through um, adju adjudication or through uh, mediation. Uh, and um, they also have a rent index. And we introduced rent pressure zones. So these are areas where there's been, rent has gone above uh, inflation of 7% in four of the last uh, six quarters, uh, and is above the national average. Um, so as you can see, mainly around Dublin and the commuter counties around there, um, around Cork in the south, and around Galway, which would be uh, a big student uh, city uh, and has a lot of pharmaceutical industries as well. So uh, those are going to be in operation for the next uh, two years and it means that rents can't go up more than 4%. So pillar five, the last pillar, is to do with uh, vacant housing. So uh, when we were developing the strategy, um, the census was, uh, was published and it identified a lot of vacant properties. So on the one hand, we had um, a lack of supply and on the other hand, we had um, uh, these vacant properties. So we've had a whole list of uh, initiatives to try and reduce the number of vacant properties, both in social housing and in the general housing stock. So that's Rebuilding Ireland. Uh, looking to the future, uh, we have a national planning framework. Uh, so we're now looking to 2040. Uh, we expect the population to grow by uh, a further million people over that period of time. And of course, that has huge housing implications. Um, so we're looking at higher density. Uh, at the moment, uh, a lot of people commute for long distances uh, from the outskirts of the city into, into Dublin. Uh, so we're looking to increase our heights uh, and do more infill and brown, brownfield sites and also uh, to have more, dense, um, more density within our cities.
So that's me. Uh, there's some um, websites that you can get further details on. The Rebuilding Ireland website is very interesting. It gives you all the uh, targets and uh, progress reports, particularly in relation to homelessness and the Social Housing Build program, and it is a good kind of update in terms of what's happening. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Our final speaker today um, is Dr. Michael Fovington. A reoccurring question this week that Michael, no, we'll leave it, we'll wait for, wait for the, later for the questions. A reoccurring question this week, does Australia need a national housing strategy? What approach should we actually take? We have the current National Housing and Homelessness Affordable Agreement, which recognises the role of the Commonwealth and states and territories in addressing homelessness and housing affordability. However, states and territories are largely accountable. Is it enough? Please welcome Dr. Michael Fotherington, Executive Director of HURI, a man who has had an exceptionally busy week this week to deliver this fantastic conference, and he's done it with a smile on his face, taking care of all the details. Now we ask you to come and speak to us, Michael. Welcome. Thank you, Louise. Look, I realise I'm about the 207th speaker at this conference, and we're getting close to the close, so I'll, I'll try to keep my points a bit short. Um, I also realise we've spent about the last two and a half days, or most of the week, talking about housing in Australia, so I don't need to be too comprehensive at this stage. Um, many better speakers than me have said, have said smarter things than I could possibly hope to. So I'll get to the point, um, and let you all get into the discussion with our, with our international guests. I'll simply provide a few framing questions, a bit of the context, and perhaps offer a few uh, provocations for the discussion with the panel. So a national approach to housing. I think it's important that a national approach, and this is picking up one of Steve's themes, does not just mean the Commonwealth Government, but a national approach must involve all tiers of government, the Commonwealth, the states and territories, local governments, and the community sectors and the commercial sectors. But at the same time, leadership is required. So who's involved? We already have a Commonwealth in involvement. Over, over the years, that's waxed and waned, but it's coming back at this point and is, is in a pretty healthy spot. We've heard a lot about NIFIC this week. We have the states and territories who've long been involved actively in housing policy. And local governments who historically have had very little involvement compared to similar nations. But to use Andrew Beer's phrase from yesterday's session on local government, these are new times in the relationship between local government and housing, and there's real opportunity there. The community sector is already highly engaged and very active, and the commercial sector has a range of roles. But what brings them together? The Commonwealth and states and ter territories, we have the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, long-term funding agreement between the Commonwealth and the states and territories that includes, importantly, homelessness as well as housing. The states and territories have strong relationships with the community sector through diverse funding programs, stock transfers, housing strategies. And the Commonwealth, the community sector, and the commercial sector coming together through the bond aggregator in NIFIC. And many, many more disparate relationships. But a funding agreement is not a strategy. And a myriad of diverse and, and disaggregated funding agreements is certainly not a strategy. Long-term funding is really important to develop capacity and build supply. But a long-term vision is needed if we want to have accountability, wider engagement, and a common direction. So what's our context? The Australian context is of course not quite the same as any of the three rep nations represented alongside us, and we but we do share traits with each of them. So in brief, our context, housing. Remote indigenous housing remains a great challenge, and it's been really important to shine a light on that challenge in this national conference, and importantly to have indigenous voices belonging in part of that national conversation. A hurry research earlier this year, the led by Julie Lawson, Report number 315 indicated that 727,000 additional social housing dwellings will be required over the next 20 years. Another Ohuri report, number 313, led by Sharon Parkinson, showed that increasing concentrations are, are turning up um, of homelessness in our major cities. But we don't know enough about the quality of our housing stock nationally. Looking at, at Philippa's slides and, and their, their knowledge of of the quality of the housing stock and the health implications of that is inspiring. We don't have systemic data on the quality of our housing stock and the implications of it. 
Some other Uhuru research published just this week shows declining home ownership um, and the impact of long-term house price growth outpacing wage growth. Population context. We have rapid population growth in, in OEC terms, very rapid population growth in Melbourne, in Sydney, and in southeast Queensland, slower growth, growth elsewhere. And that pace and that distribution of growth leads to some real challenges for infrastructure and leads to discussion of a national settlement strategy. Infrastructure Australia released an audit this month um, which importantly recognised social housing as a key part of infrastructure and one that is facing significant challenges and which impact the whole of housing markets right across the continuum. We have a, a slowing economy with historically low rates and the use of low interest rates to stimulate the economy is reaching its limits. It does offer productivity advantages and value for money uh, opportunity to commence delivery of housing at scale through counter cyclical investment, but Reserve Bank Governor Philip Lowe this month suggested that the, to the Standing Committee on Economics that rather than mon monetary policy, infrastructure spending and policies that support business growth are what's needed. The federal government is engaging with cities policy in new ways. Smart cities discussion has, has evolved into a staccato program of city deals across the country. We have increasingly complex governance of our cities with the city deals and regional deals, Organisations like the Greater Sydney Commission taking new roles, alliances of local governments popping up in, in major cities, uh, and local government peaks being more active, the ALGA, the National Growth Areas Alliance, Alliance, the Council of Capital City Lord Mayors and others. We see committees from Melbourne, Adelaide, Sydney and a raft of other cities emerging, which began as new age chambers of commerce but are now evolving into much more, and they're starting to collaborate with each other. So many of these alliances and peaks and, and intergovernment deals are, are taking an interest in housing and individual local governments are doing more and more in that space. How do local government affording housing strategies align with state affordable housing strategies? It's a bit like the population projections of this country where the national population projections are not the sum of the state and territory population projections, which in turn are not the sum of the local government population projections. So we're all planning for different futures. To bring it back to housing though, Housing and cities are not disconnected issues. State governments are recognising this. In Tasmania, we have a Minister for Housing who's also a Minister for Planning. Same thing coming up in Victoria now. And there's an emergence in, in many states on a focus on precincts and places within government structures. More complexity for cities. Most of the city deals do include some consideration of housing, but not as a central point. So, do we need a national housing strategy? Capital M, capital H, capital S. How do we work across tiers of government, across departments within government? Frankly, within branches, how do we work across branches within departments? Bill Randolph last, yesterday called for a national integrated approach, bringing together housing, planning and infrastructure. We need that, we need more than that though. We need to work across state lines and across sectors. So what do Canada, Ireland and New Zealand teach us? So observations from the, the three speakers and my scans of their nations. The importance of a shared dialogue, of developing partnerships and consulting widely, but not for too long. The importance of boldness, of having ambitious but achievable targets, and targets that are measurable. The importance of a multi-pronged approach, a range of complementary priorities as we see in Canada, or pillars as we see in Ireland, that work together across homelessness, social housing, private rent and home ownership. I think another theme that comes up though is the, thing, the need to start slowly and to then build momentum, to not expect it all to happen at once. We need to include the commercial sectors, not just government and not just the community sector. And I think for too long in Australia we've said the private sector should, without really engaging them in the conversation. I think another theme that comes through is the role of advocacy and the important role of evidence behind that. And as Executive Director of Uhuru, I very strongly support that. Um, I, I was very interested in Steve's take on, on long-run advocacy and the role of fake news, um, but getting that political traction over time to understand the, the larger system in which housing operates. I think the priorities around distinct need and so enhancing social housing, balanced supply and sustainability play very well in this country. And I take your point about the need to be flexible, to get on with it rather than try and get it right. Just get it, get it, get going and improve as you go. 
I'm envious of New Zealand's stock take on housing and, and knowing what we're living in would be a really good start. Understanding the co-benefits of better housing is something we need to do more. And I'm very impressed with, with that, that take on the right to housing. That's something we need to recognise better. Warm, dry, safe and stable. I think in, in Darwin that might be cool, dry, safe and stable. But the concept is clear. And the role of evidence is, is really important in that. That, that Ireland understand that housing underpins community is, is, is an important point too. And again, the role of consensus in shaping that agenda. Very impressed to see housing as the top priority for government. I'd love to see that across the country here. Um, the, the connection of, of infrastructure in, in housing through the activation fund, the role of planning within that, both sitting under the pillar for more homes, makes a lot of sense and would make a lot of sense here too. The regulation of short-term letting is, I think, another thing we need to look at more closely. And I'd like to hear more about what you're doing to inspire Build to Rent. It's something we're working with in Australia. I'll stop now. That's enough of my reflections on what the international speakers say. I want to hear what you think about what the international speakers have had to say. And I'll hand back to Louise. Thank you, Michael. Well, now it's your turn. Um, get out to your device and send through your question. We've got about 25 minutes. Um, and it's your chance to ask this fantastic panel some really poignant questions about um, what we can do here in Australia. So while you're getting your device out and formulating your questions, I'm going to, I'm going to kick off with the first one. And this is to the whole panel. Steve, 20 years in the making. David, you, you came off a supply cliff you know, we all lost our stomachs on that particular slide. Is it worth the effort to get a national housing strategy happening? And is it making a difference? Do you see a difference in terms of having a national approach, a national strategy? Sure, I'll give it a shot. Um, I think we're, it's very early days for us. So it, I mean, the jury, I think, is still out on that. Uh, the, you know, the, the implementation of a strategy is, is, is more difficult than actually designing the strategy. And certainly, when you're, if, if it's a, a heavily supply-based strategy, we know it takes three or four years uh, to actually go through the planning process, get into construction, get the financing, get the thing built, and get it occupied. So you know, the, the fruits of your labor are, are, are somewhat delayed in that respect. But I think uh, you know, for us, uh, having the strategy, it, ha it has gotten very strong attention at all levels of government. It has given us a, a modicum of financial commitment. And as I mentioned, the, 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 that long-term commitment and predictability, I think, is really, really key. And I think in that respect, that's probably the, the greatest benefit of the Canadian strategy. We'll, we'll see how things continue to roll out. Just reflecting on the New Zealand um, scene, the, the previous Labour government did put a lot of effort into having um, a national housing strategy, but that only lasted as long as that government, and then it was completely ignored. <coughs> so I'm not sure that, it's an interesting question, but I'm not sure that it's actually worth the effort. If it's very clear that actually we need more public housing and see it as fundamental infrastructure, that we use this part of the economic cycle that we're in to raise money both from, um, for the government to raise money and to give, uh, help agencies have the capital to go ahead and build good quality housing that's gonna last for 70 years, to um, recognize that we have to stop people becoming homeless if the problem that affects us all is not going to increase. I, I, I'm becoming increasingly pragmatic about um, what to do about climate change, those things, rather than trying to do as I sat down round in the first national housing strategy, endless meetings about coming, trying to come to a consensus. I think it's quite, I think it's clear what we have to do, and I think it's important to try and go ahead and do it rather than having a strategy myself. That's a rather iconoclastic view, but that's how I feel at the moment. Um, rebuilding Ireland has been really quite crucial in terms of setting the framework for what we're going to do 
we were in such a big mess that um, it, you know, we really did need a plan in terms of how, what, what are we going to do first and how are we going to tackle such a huge issue. So going from a situation where you had 90,000 homes being built to 10,000, um, going from a situation where you had uh, thousands of empty homes around the country uh, to a situation where you had housing shortages in the cities. Um, we needed some sort of plan to try and um, sort out what the priorities were and all of the actions in the programme are um, tagged to a quarter and tagged to a resource and tagged to uh, somebody who's responsible for implementing them. Uh, and the minister then meets with, for example, the local authorities and says, what are you doing about your building programme? And he goes through around the table one by one and they have to have their homework done. So there's a lot of account uh, accountability around the strategy, but it also means that the minister can then go to the minister for finance and say, I need this money to do these actions and it provides the, the arguments for that. So because the strategy was agreed by the government, it's not just the Department of Housing strategy, it's the government strategy. Um, the Department of Finance have to be on board in terms of implementing it. Uh, so it, 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 it creates that consensus. It also holds the government to account as well by the opposition parties who are saying, you're not doing enough about this, this and this, and you, you know, you, you, you're falling behind on certain targets. So it does, it, it helps every side in, in terms of that. Um, and going out from the core strategy, there have been other strategies developed around the rental sector, around vacant properties, which you know means that we, you then have um, further developments and further actions going out from the, the core strategy. So the big thing for us will be what are we going to do when we get to the end of 2021 and Rebuilding Ireland is essentially finished um, and we'll have to think about where we're going then in the longer term. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, I was thinking, actually, what's happened in New Zealand with the wellbeing budget, really, in some ways, if it works, and if people um, commit to it, it, it it's almost supersedes strategies for individual sectors. For in housing, because it's critical social infrastructure, it's no longer, this is what we want to do, but actually, if we get it right, then that long tail of children who are not doing well at school because they're constantly moving around or they're in hospital and they're in sick, that's going to save money for um, the hospitals, the taxpayers. If we stop people having injuries in their home, that means that no longer people are off work for long periods getting rehabilitated. And, and likewise, going through all the sectors so that it, it, it changes the nature of cabinet debates about, I want more money. You know, that great public policy um, dilemma, everybody benefits, but nobody wants to pay for it under their individual strategy. So I, I, think, um, it, it, I think it's heroic that we're actually trying to do it because we're a unicameral government. It's kind of easier. I worked for once for the Melbourne and they, went, uh, they used to say, oh, it's a federal problem and, you know, or a state problem. And were, that was the argy bargy at the beginning. So we do have the advantage of a small scale, but I think it's a pretty heroic experiment. I have a second crack at this. I, mean, I think, you know, one, one thing I think we can see from Canada is that ours has is, is, been quite heavily politicized. And I think there is a risk when, you know, it's the liberals strategy uh, of the next guy throwing it out because, they, you know, they're not the liberals. Uh, and, so I, and I heard a term thrown around this room a number of times this week about a, bar ta a bar bipartisan approach. So I think it is critically important that as part of the process that it is truly bipartisan and truly, truly multi uh, um, intergovernmental and that the lower levels, uh, in our case, the provinces, are actually engaged as equal partners, not as guys to come along and sort of follow what the federal government does. So I think it's, it's whether you have a strategy or not, it's not as important as how you do it and, and how you frame it that way. Fantastic. So this question's from Chris Chaplin. He said, well, what makes a national housing strategy so difficult in Australia compared to Canada, New Zealand and Ireland? Michael, do you want to start with this one? <laughs> Thanks, Louise. <laughs> I'm not sure that it is more difficult here. I mean, Steve talked about 20 years of advocacy, of uh, truth-telling, of a form. <laughs> That's right. I mean, we're, we're not 20 years into that argument. Um, I hope it doesn't take us 20 years. You know, I think, you know, the, the glossy document is, is, is nice to have and, and is useful. But what is more important is that coordination of effort and, and having a, 
a shared objective and, and working collaboratively across tiers and across sectors. We need that now. Um, I, maybe Australia hasn't had the same crisis that other countries have had. And, um, you know, in a way, the, the, the context is important uh, in terms of the motivation for dealing with the problem. Um, so, you know, taking Darwin as an example, you know, um, it was devastated uh, in 74 and, and rebuilt. Uh, if it hadn't been devastated, would you have that high rise in town now that, that, that you have? Uh, you probably wouldn't because pe people would just probably just keep building out and, and so on. Um, so, you know, because you have a crisis, it is an opportunity as well to reset things uh, and, to, and to change things. So, um, while I wouldn't encourage you to have a housing crisis, um, <laughs> you know, it, it is important to think about the context as well. Yeah, it's interesting you should put it that way, David. I mean, I, you know, it's, I talked about the deaths on the streets, on the, on the, uh, the legislative greats in Toronto in 1998, uh, and I think, you know, that was our crisis. Uh, in, in many respects, and I think you know, sometimes you've got to think pretty low before you can uh, can react to those kind of things. So it's, I mean, it's it's scary in some respects, but you know, falling off the cliff um, is, is perhaps what you have to do before you can actually realise we, we could have actually put up a fence and been, been preventative. And I think we're, we're learning a lot from the uh, you know responses to homelessness, upstream prevention, as opposed to waiting till people are homeless and then trying to house them is clearly much more effective. So if we can kind of take some parallels from that and say, okay, how do we apply that in a policy? sense and you know can we get around the politics uh, and and and, cre and create something that is going to actually be an effective uh, you know roadmap for the future on, on a bipartisan nature um, I would like to add to that I mean we had um, similar problems and very acute and very worrying ones but what happened in New Zealand I guess is um, like that great book by Mariana Mar Mazzucato called the entrepreneurial state. It gave an opportunity for the state to say, of course we want to work with the private sector and particularly the community sector and Māori iwi who are a growing part of the economy, but we want, we want some coordination through the state. Not that we're going to preclude the community sector, but we're going to take the lead in terms of raising money and, and thinking of innovative ways to get bonds and so forth. So it reinvigorated the state in a way in which um, previously it was understood that the state should be a night watchman and step back and let um, the private sector work. Here we see that there has to be a, now we're seeing that there has to be a very strong partnership and it has to be with local government. Um, so in a sense we're resurrecting some of the things that happened after the war where there was local government housing and state housing and private housing. So. Um, yeah, I, I'd say we're a very interesting example of an entrepreneurial state at the moment. And we are the size, of course, of an Australian state. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, we know the importance of collaboration. We know the importance of bringing all sectors together to, to work um, for housing outcomes. But the strategies, David, strategies, it's your minister sitting around with your um, officials that seem to be held account. And then there's targets. Who should own those targets? Who should own the strategies? Do, is, is it more than just government that should be accountable? Um, yes, I mean, uh, there are certain targets set for the housing agency uh, in, in rebuilding Ireland, which we've been working on. Um, and very much we own those targets. Um, and the, the, the department and the minister will hold us to account and our board hold us to account on a monthly basis in terms of how we're working towards particular targets, be they completing things within certain times or buying a certain number of properties. Um, the local authorities certainly own their targets and um, they're very much kept under um, uh, control, monitored by the department and by the, um, the minister in terms of reaching particular targets. Um, it is difficult sometimes because um, you might have a target and uh, you know you w within rebuilding Ireland the overall target is being met but um, individual 
deep down targets. This one might be just a little under, and this one is a bit over to, to, to balance it. So I think you can get obsessed about the targets a little bit. Uh, so you, you need to sort of think of the bigger picture uh, at the same time, not let it drift off. Um, so it, I think the targets are useful in terms of where the home place is, but you have to sort of be flexible around the targets as well, because sometimes some things just take longer to get a good product. You don't want to rush into it and, and, and have the wrong type of housing, because it's going to be there for hopefully 100 years. Uh, and you want to make sure that it's not a, a bad legacy that you leave behind. Oh, that's the stuff that was built, you know, um, during that period of time. So you, you really want to have good communities at the end of it as well. Uh, targets, well, uh, in, and public, he public health quite likes target as a discipline because it means that you've got something to aim for. On the other hand, we know from a number of areas like stopping smoking, for example, it's very easy to sort of think that you've mixed, missed, that you've hit a target. I don't like that language particularly, but that you've reached it. Uh, but then to find out that there's a very big difference between um, um, people who, like Māori, Pacific, older people, and so forth. There's big inequalities that are hidden within a an, in, within an average, and so we've. We've been deconstructing that and thinking about we've got to get those Māori rates of home ownership. Well, Māori have to be enabled to have home ownership going up from 28% to the to the 60% that's the national average, given that a century ago they had the highest rate of home ownership. So we, we have to exercise specific efforts to get Māori home ownership higher, hence the move to papakainga housing. And... Um, um, people here here who are discussing that, John Kake and people. So I think that's really, that's what we think about targets. They have to be targeted <laughs> to particular populations. I mean, I'm, I, I've already spoken about targets. I think it, it is important to have them because that's how you measure progress. But I think the other thing here is it, it's not just about funding uh, in a strategy. It's really about you know, fundamentally, we need a system change. And we need to do things, you know, what we've been doing for the last 20 years didn't work very well, and we need to do things differently. So just throwing more money at doing the same old thing is really the wrong approach. And if you're going to do system change, it's very hard to do that from the top down and impose it on all of the stakeholders in the system. And we see, we see this at the local level. All of our cities are required to uh, develop housing and homeless plans. Some cities have done it. The, the, the municipal planners, the housing department, have done the plan uh, and sent it off to the minister and said, here we go, we've we got our plan done did some token consultation with the community sector. The cities that have been had, had really successful housing and homeless plans have been the ones that have pushed it out to the community sector, had the community sector be the active architects of the plan. They own it. Uh, a government's role is to enable them to then implement it and, and, and work with that. So I th and, and, if, and, and part of that is repurposing some funding, changing the roles that certain organizations have. Some are really competent in certain areas and they're crap in others. And you want to kind of reshift you know, the roles and responsibilities. And, and, and forcing people to change is a very hard thing to do. Getting them to accept that you know, if we do things differently, we can achieve these better outcomes. So I think that you know, it, it, it works very well at the local level. How you do that at a national level, I think, is a big challenge. Michael, did you want to comment on targets? I'm in favour. Okay, fantastic. We're going to do, I'm going to do two things at the moment. I'm going to ask the panel to think of uh, an answer to the next question, which is name no more than two things that you did well that could be implemented in Australia. So I'm going to give you thinking time. While they've got thinking time, um, we're going to do a poll. We're going to do that live poll. So I'm... Yes, I've got the attention of the folk up there, our fantastic AV team. Thank you so much for all your uh, great work this week. So we're going to do an app polling question. Um, so on your mobile devices, select the live polling icon on the app homepage. And we should have a question, look at that, coming up on the screen there. So the question is, the main benefit of a national, housing, a national approach to housing is, number one, Consistency and certainty for financiers. Number two, increased focus on housing issues. Number three, a shared vision. Number four, there's no benefit. Number five, so we can stop arguing about the lack of a national strategy. So you have um, about 10 seconds, I think, to put in your answers.
have a look here. A shared vision is just nudging increased focus on housing issues. You know, there's an old proverb that says, write the vision plainly so that everybody can run hard and actually deliver it. So there's some, there's some um, wisdom in that. Back to our panel. What two things? Do you remember the question? Yeah? Okay. Name no more than two things that you did well that could be implemented in Australia. Okay, so um, I suppose the first thing is making sure that housing is the key priority in government. So um, within our system, housing and health are in competition with each other for uh, the, the, the big ticket. And uh, at the moment, I think housing is, is winning in terms of getting that, that attention from government and uh, all of the government departments are, are behind uh, making sure that housing works. Uh, because uh, the Department of Employment will tell you that we need housing to, to be economically competitive. The Department of Health will tell you that we need housing to make sure that we can um, have healthy environments for people. Education will tell you housing is so important. Uh, we, we need to increase student accommodation to make sure that we can accommodate uh, foreign students coming to Ireland, etc. So everybody will talk about housing. Uh, it's a little bit of a national obsession. It's coming in second to the weather uh, for us. Um, so uh, that, that's been really important. That's number one, that, that's uh, at a high level. Um, I suppose at a sec the second one would be that um, we have tried lots of different things. So, we, you know, when it comes to the planning system, we've tried lots of different things in terms of affordability. We've tried lots of different things. So we're very open to innovation and there's a willingness around innovation. So it's not like we've always done it this way and we have to do it this way. Um, there's lots of innovation going on in terms of uh, dealing with different problems and an openness to look at what's working and what's not working and let's give it a go and see if it, see if it does work. So there's that. There's that open, I think the second thing that strategy has, has brought to the table is kind of looking at there's more than one way to, to fix this. So we need to start and look at all the different things and see which one works. Great, thank you. Philippa. Thanks. Um, well, the first one is a bit of a um, dilemma for me because I'm a reviewer of um, some Ahuri um, research. And so I look at this all really good research and I always say to people in my group, oh, go and look at what Ahuri is doing. And yet somehow there seems to be a disconnect, and this might be my ignorance, forgive me, between the research that's done in Ahuri and what, the ha what is done in housing policy. So I... I, I, I <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're looking at me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I, I, I do think one of the things that we are able to do in New Zealand, of course, it's size. It's um, it, we are able to um, have research evidence informed policy. It's not perfect, but it definitely there's a lively discussion about it. And actually, partly we do that by using the conversation in Australia to get things because we've got no reporters basically now, and they just pick up things that are done in Australia. So we haven't talked about the media, but I think we've got to use that more to be able to think about getting the values, the common consensus. And, and the second thing I think that we've shown that is possible, um, we, that we have a um, renewed, renewed culture that the state is not um, in the way, but the state can actually help facilitate things without crowding out everybody else. And I think that well-being framework, to keep an eye on it, I think it's going to be pretty interesting internationally. So I would say the res research evidence informed policy and the renewed culture that the state can have a positive role. Thank you. Not just in war. Preventing war. Um, yeah, but before I give you my tour, I'd say if you had changed the question on that poll, from consistency and predictability for the community housing uh, providers, I, instead of using the word financiers, I bet you would have had a very, very different answer on that poll. Uh, no one wants to give the financiers more help, but they want to help the, the sector. Um, I think the two things we've done well, speaking of the community sector, is we spent a lot of time nurturing and building the community housing sector, and we had a series of seed grant programs to capitalize and fund technical resource organizations to help the small nonprofit community organizations who had no experience in building housing to actually get it built and get those organizations started. So it was fundamental to building and subsequently growing uh, the community housing sector. So it's a really important part of our sort of earlier ecosystem uh, in, in growing that part of the 
the, the sector. And I think the other thing that Canada is, is quite renowned for is a very effective uh, housing finance system uh, where our, our federal housing agency, Canada Mortgage and Housing, uh, as the name suggests, so in the, in the mortgage business, um, they, have, they have, since 1954, provided um, uh, mortgage loan insurance uh, to, to uh, both homeowner loans and to social housing loans and rental loans, um, and that's enabled access to financing to be a very easy thing to do. Uh, and using the Crown Borrowing Facility in, 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 under the National Housing Strategy, they are now back into direct lending and effectively doing the same things that uh, NIFAC's doing. Uh, we didn't have to create a new organization, we already had one, and we're, we're basically levering the expertise of them in, 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 in the financing space. So access to finance for us is not an issue. Subsidy gaps is another question, but we're, we're good at financing. Thank you. You've given us so many questions up here, it's, it's hard to actually read through them all, but if I do a quick thematic analysis here, I think there is a comment that says, that sums up, I think, much of the sentiment in the room. Can we please just recognise that it's a bipartisan issue and just do it? Can you thank this fantastic panel that we've had here this morning?